we have to be open to having these discussions with our colleagues and there's no shame in failure. Failure is a lesson, it's a tool for growth. And, um, you know, I think we should all be open to sharing what we've experienced and, um, you know, so that the next generation of operator can, you know, have some advantage. That's not, that's gonna advance the entire industry. That's not going to give someone an advantage on you. And, you know, I'm, I'm just not a fan of this, like, sort of hoarding of information because I think we all grow and uh, learn when we share it. And I, you know, that's what I would encourage, um, you know, people going into industry. I always say, when I speak to people, I say, talk to as many people who will listen and listen to as many people who will talk. Thanks again, audience, for tuning into the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. You know, James Andrew Beard needs no introduction. Famous for cooking school, being a TV personality, famous chef, famous author, and of course, the James Beard Foundation Awards. Well, that's what this episode is all about. It's really the gold standard for chefs. Chefs, of course, are the life of our business. Obviously, our restaurants couldn't survive without them. So I'm really pleased to offer this episode talking all about the James Beard Awards, what the foundation is all about, what their mission is all about how they're raising the standard for gender equality and sustainability. This episode has it all. Two ladies that are head of the awards committee. We're going to talk all about the criteria for the awards and how you win and how you're nominated and all the ins and outs of what James Beard Foundation is all about. So stay tuned. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. People go to restaurants for lots of reasons. What the customer doesn't know is the thousands of details it takes to run a great restaurant. This is a high risk, high fail business. It's a treacherous road and smart operators need a professional guide. I'm Roger. I've started many highly successful, high profit restaurants. I'm passionate about helping other owners and managers not just succeed, but knock it out of the park. You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to dominate your competition and create a lasting legacy. Join the Academy, and I'll show you how it's done. Welcome back, everyone, to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. I'm really excited because the James Beard Foundation and the James Beard Awards need no introduction. Illustrious program. And with me today, Dawn Padmore, the Vice President of Awards, and Tanya Holland, who is the chair of the James Beard Foundation Awards Committee. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm pleased to have you both here. We're going to get into all about the awards and what the James Beard Foundation is all about. But before we do, I'd love to ask you, this is a business of passion. It's a business of creativity, and it's a business of hospitality. Now, everyone's got a story of how they got into this business, and it's, I'm sure it's very interesting, but I'd like to ask each of you, you know, what your story is when it comes to hospitality. I'll let Tanya go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mine's a little long. Um, well, I mean, hospitality really started in my home. I grew up with uh, parents who were from the South, from Shreveport, Louisiana. I grew up in Rochester, New York, and uh, they moved there when I was two because my dad got a job with Kodak, and they were making new friends, and the way they made friends were inviting them over uh, for dinner to serve some of the food they grew up eating that they missed. And they also founded a gourmet cooking club um, that lasted 20 years. And this is in the um, early seventies. And in, you know, the beginning, it was three white couples and three black couples. That's as diverse as the community was, but that was significant back then. And Mm -hmm. they cooked food from soup to nuts from all over the world, American regional food, And, you know, they got these recipes from Time Life. They had, you know, beverage pairings. And so a lot of those dishes ended up in my mom's um, repertoire. So I grew up eating matzo ball soup, chicken cacciatore. You know, they did a Polynesian luau. They did an Alsatian Rhine dinner, Pennsylvania Dutch. They did a Jewish Seder, you know. So I just, like, um, was fortunate enough to be exposed to that. And then I got to college and I started when I moved into my first apartment with friends, my second year, I started hosting dinner parties and working as a server in the restaurant business. So that's where I started. 
And uh, I moved to New York in the late 80s and was very inspired by the business. It was just exciting and it was diverse. And I saw this gap in the market I hadn't seen in uh, a restaurant that reflected the cuisine of my heritage where the food, the hospitality, the service, um, the, the decor all came together. And so I decided I wanted to do that. I went to cooking school in France. I was fortunate enough to work for some of the best chefs in New York, Boston, and Martha's Vineyard before moving to California in 2001. And then I decided I wasn't going to work in the restaurant business anymore. I decided to write a cookbook. I was on the Food Network. And uh, then somebody said, if you want to you know, open your restaurant, I'll invest. So I went back into it and uh, founded Brown Sugar Kitchen in 2008. And um, I'm very passionate about hospitality more than cooking even. I just love providing people with an experience, bringing them together. I love the, um, you know, just the, you know, the way people can interact over food, it just break down, it breaks down barriers and um, just, you know, makes an even playing field. So that's some of my story. I don't want to take up all the time. That is a that is a great definition of hospitality. And food, of course, is the universal language. It is, yeah. like you said, it brings people together, diverse cultures, diverse races. It's all about that. That is just a wonderful thing. It's interesting. You mentioned the Food Network. And, and also, I understand that you've competed on Top Chef. I mean, these are really really illustrious type, uh, you know, it, it raises the profile of chefs in general and lots of people yeah. watch cooking shows and some yeah. of these are obviously really, really popular. And you have a new show coming out. I, I understand on HBO, it's called Selena and chef with Selena Gomez. So how do you, how did you discover these opportunities? Did they find you? Did you find them? It's just a part and parcel of your career, but tell us about that. So mo most of them all found me, but you know, it's all based on the relationships that I've been building over time and my reputation that I've mm -hmm. built by, you know, the people that I've worked for and the work that I've done. And, um, you know, people have come to trust me. And I was telling somebody asked me that the other day, how did I make it happen? I said, you know, it's being prepared, as everybody says, always, you know, it's like half the success is, is preparation, um, being responsive when people reach out to me. So, you know, responding right away. There's a chef here who told me, just give the journalists your cell phones, like, don't worry about it, you know, and answer it when they call, you know? So, of course. Um, but right place at the right time, literally the first opportunity, the Food Network, I was, you know, taking a break from cooking and I was waiting tables in Manhattan. And um, I had taken some classes at Peter Kump. So it's kind of the pseudo alum which is now the Institute for Culinary Education. But Peter Kump was a contemporary of James Beard and Julia Child, and he found it on the Upper East Side. So um, the director of um, career placement called me and said, I had told him I was looking for a sous chef job or executive sous chef. And he said, I don't have that, but the Food Network is looking for an African-American female chef. And I wonder if you're interested. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, and I... I'd only done one appearance on a local show in Boston. And so it was, you know, it was a bit scary going in front of the camera, but they put us through media training. And again, that's just, you know, timing and relationships and, you know, Selena and chef, they reached out to me. Um, I've been wanting to do more television and I, you know, I make a lot of calls and it's sort of, I'm just a believer of you put it out there into the ether, to the universe, whatever you believe in, you have intentions and um, you keep talking to people about it. And that's that's how it manifests. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really um, I've always been very goal oriented and um, ambitious and but also open to what it might look like. You know, you just never know. Like when I was in cooking school, I never imagined being on television because I thought <clears throat> it was a place where older people ended up, meaning like Julia Child and. Jacques Pepin, you know, who are significantly older than me, right? So I thought, well, by the time I'm six years, 70, maybe I'll do TV, but who knew that, you know, the meat, it was going to change and, you know, their opportunities would be come sooner. So restaurant owners and managers, I call this the business of a thousand details. And you've got more important things to worry about than calculating and paying your monthly sales tax on time. Well, that's where Davo comes in. 
Davo puts sales tax on autopilot for restaurants. Davo uses sales tax data from your point of sale system to set aside the exact amount of sales tax you collect every single day and then files it and pays it when it's due on time for your restaurant every month. Davo takes just five minutes to set up, and once it's up and running, you never have to worry about paying sales tax again. Davo costs $49.99 per POS connection per month, and your restaurant can try Davo for the first 30 days free. Davo was created by a successful restaurant chef and owner who knows what's important for your operation. Time is money, and you've got more important things to focus on, like pleasing your guests. You can't put a price on peace of mind. Why not try Davo for the first 30 days at DavoSalesTax.com? That's great. They say that opportunity is where luck and preparation meet. So perhaps that's, that's right. part that's, of the story. That's the saying I was looking for. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. That's a wonderful story, Tanya. Okay, Dawn, it's your turn. You're up. Tell us all about your story. Sure. Mine is a little different from Tanya's. Uh, I actually uh, came to into the hospitality space by chance. So I went to grad school at University of Minnesota School of Music, got my master's in vocal performance, moved to New York to become a classical singer, like a professional classical singer, which, you know, I continue to uh, pursue and perform. And I needed, of course, to pay my rent, right, Mm -hmm. in between auditions. And so I came across this really small agency uh, run by this woman named Melanie Young, And uh, she had the James Beard Foundation as a client. And so I actually cut my teeth in the culinary and hospitality business working as I think I started as a coordinator or something, uh, but working on the awards team um, through her agency. And it was cool. I think my connection to chefs like Tanya and others that I've worked with over the years comes from the artistic standpoint, right? Chefs are artists. Chefs have sure. a creative, yeah. So chefs have a um, a creative workflow, and I feel like I could relate to that. And the awards were like putting on a show, so it was like perfect. And I just sort of found this other career, as it were, um, that was very fulfilling. Um, so I worked there for a while. Um, it was really really cool. My, I would say my first official official real culinary experience was uh, way back in the day. Uh, and I went to Greg Kunz's restaurant when he was at Les Pinas. And I still remember the dish. I still remember how it no tasted. Kidding. I mean, are you serious? It was crazy. It made an impact. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. so. And I was like, yeah. okay, I like this. If the singing thing doesn't work at all, yeah. this is awesome. Um, I've been lucky to do both though. Anyway, so I was there for a while and I got to work with wonderful chefs, you know, work on the awards uh, in a manager position, moved on to work on other projects there. And then I eventually moved to another agency called Carlitz and Company. I was there for a while. Uh, There I was brought in uh, initially to work on the official and first ever New York City Wine and Food Festival. So I, I was on that inaugural team. Uh, supporting the chefs uh, at the first event and then, you know, moved around within the uh, department, ended up being a lead producer for their Foxwoods Casino Festival. I worked on, worked, uh, on uh, curating and creating a first-time festival in St. Petersburg, Florida uh, called in Eat St. Pete, basically, and eventually our firm partnered with Marcus Samuelson and his group to create Mm -hmm. the annual Harlem Eat Up Festival, which I would say was one of my crown jewels anyway, um, in my career. And that was really cool because it was the first time I think that I really got to see myself and see us create a platform that really shone a spotlight, not just on the more famous chefs, but some famous chefs in Harlem and some not so famous chefs and really mixing all of them up with some, you know, more national names. It was really cool. Uh, And then I got this wonderful opportunity to join the Beard Foundation in a completely new role that never existed before. And here I am. 
<laughs> oh, thanks for sharing. You know, you mentioned Marcus Samuelson, and he's certainly, um, you know, gotten a lot of fame with his restaurant, Red Rooster, I believe it's called. And yep. is, is Harlem now a food destination? Has he sort of put Harlem on the map and now it's a real draw? Because Manhattan, New York City, it, it is such an eclectic mix of every kind of cuisine from around the world. You know, yep. it's, it's a food city for sure. And I don't need to tell anyone that, but now Marcus is, you know, he's elevated. And I know that he's also involved, I believe in programs that teach young chefs skills and bring people in from the inner city and give them a career and a path and all that. I've followed some of this. And I love seeing that because this is the business where you don't need a formal education. You can literally start off in the dishwasher room and end up owning your own chain of restaurants. I had a, a dishwasher that started with me at age 15 and mm -hmm. he was with me for 15 years and he, he ran two of my kitchens. And then after that, he went out and he started his own restaurant. So anything is possible in this business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say this. I think Harlem has always been a hub, a culinary and cultural hub mm -hmm. um, for, um, you know, decades and decades and decades. Uh, I think that you can find almost the entire world in Harlem as far as uh, cuisine is concerned, and that's very exciting. For sure, Marcus definitely has left and continues to leave his mark on Harlem, but there are other chefs there and restaurateurs out there too, who I, I think, uh, I don't want to start naming names because I'll forget somebody and they'll be like, you didn't mention me, but uh -huh. who right. have had a significant impact, yep. I think, uh, in that community as far as the culinary scene, um, and also supporting the community. I think I learned a lot in the last few years of working with Carl. It's, on, it's not just about the food on the plate. It's how you are impacting your immediate team, your, of course, your guests, you know. For sure. Uh, you're in service to your guests by the kind of food you serve, your, the hospitality of you and your staff, but also how you are impacting your community. So leaders, you know, I'll name a few people because I just, I love so many okay, people in Harlem, do. but, you know, um, you've got, uh, of course, the, the Woods family from Sylvia's, um, you've got Melba Wilson, you've got uh, Sky and Chef Raymond from Lolo Seafood Shack. Uh, J.J. Johnson from Field Trip, who I think is kind of blowing things up, you know. Excellent. You've got uh, Pierre Chiam uh, and his team from Taranga, which is one of the first, we'll call it like a, a West African type cuisine at the Africa Center. There are so many. There's Mountain Bird. I'm sure I'm leaving a few people out. Uh, Vinateria. Um, but there are just a few examples of the food scene. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's, <laughs> that brought it all to life for me. Let's get into the history and the mission of the James Beard Foundation. And let's start with James Andrew Beard, who this foundation is named from. Why don't you tell us a little bit about him? Not everyone is familiar with where it all started, but yeah, let's talk about the history and mission and, and where it all began. Sure. So I think most people know that James Beard was a cook, uh, a cookbook author, um, a huge personality, um, and he left his mark clearly uh, on uh, the culinary scene in this country. Interestingly enough, the Beard Foundation uh, began really after his passing by his friends, including Peter Kump and Julia Child, uh, over at the Beard House at 167 West 12th Street. Um, I think, you know, it's always been an organization that uh, was created to celebrate American cuisine and the people who make it, the people in the hospitality industry. It has, the organization, I think over the last, what, 30 years have has gone through um, a lot of changes, you know, nothing is stagnant. Um, and over the last couple of years, uh, including when, uh, before Tanya joined as uh, board of trustee member, and also as chair of the awards committee, you know, went through some major changes. And it's a nonprofit and it really exists to serve those in the industry. And I would say over the last few years, you'll see uh, they have so many programs that support people in the industry, everyone, right? Those who you could say have made it, those who maybe have not had as many doors open 
to them. They've got the Women's Leadership Program, for example, uh, the Chef's Boot Camp. I know, Tanya, you can probably talk a little bit about those programs. Uh, and more recently, uh, we, they, we've just created this wonderful fellows program that piloted this past year for young people who uh, receive training and some like mentoring uh, mm -hmm. as they make their way in the industry. So it's, it's an amazing organization. And, you know, like everybody, every other organization continues to grow, moving toward more equity, creating more accessibility and the resources that people in the hospitality business need to move forward in their careers. When did the awards begin? Uh, 1990. My goodness, I feel like I'm being tested. <laughs> 1990. Okay, that, that brings a little of the history of life. Okay. Oh, yep. How would you say, and either of you can answer this question, but, you know, everyone has an idea of what the James Beard Foundation is. And, you know, there are a lot of chefs that are James Beard Award winners, and that elevates the profile of those chefs and the restaurants. How did it gain such prestige and recognition? Is there sort of a trajectory where it just sort of gained momentum and steam? And, and now it's kind of the benchmark of, you know, the chef. When you think of a James Beard Award winner, it's spectacular cuisine, it's, it's hospitality, it's an elevated dining situation. I mean, that's what comes to mind when I think of it. And well, it's so many things to so many people. But let's talk about, you know, where did it gain prestige and recognition? Or how do you think that came about? Everyone knows that Smithfield Culinary has a full line of great ready-to-cook to ready-to-eat ready products from Smithfield and Margarita. But what else is cooking? Tap into the latest culinary trends and get inspired with new recipes created by real working chefs from across the country. Bring more to the table with flavors and new menu ideas your guests will savor. Visit smithfieldculinary.com or follow at Smithfield Culinary on social media. Well, I think... I think that clearly there was a need to celebrate and award people in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think James Beard was a big name. And I think that over the years, uh, chefs, people in the business have become more mainstream or known in a more mainstream manner. I would suspect that the creation of Food Network and shows uh, that they put on, as well as the newer ones, have really helped to put the spotlight on, on the industry for your consumer who likes to eat or likes to cook at home. So I, I do think that had uh, made a difference. And I think also, uh, you know, people love food, you know, and people love awards shows. Uh, and besides that, there's also the media awards, which includes three other awards, book, journalism, and broadcast. I think just the constant build on the initial programs has just, you know, continued to, make it an you know the most prestigious award that one can win in the in the space that's one that's my take on it yeah okay that that makes sense so new categories you mentioned journalism and and books and uh not just chefs are recognized right restaurateurs can be res recognized journalists that's right. anyone that brings attention to this industry in a positive way is that's all free you know fair game I think so. Yes. Yeah. So the uh, media awards have been in existence for a real for actually quite a while, and each each of the programs that fall under that umbrella uh, have existed for a long time. Actually, it's just that most people don't know about them as much. So uh, I would say that for book, it's obviously for cookbooks, right? Mm -hmm. And there are many, many, many categories uh, within that program. And then you've got journalism for writing about food mostly sure. or any or adjacent to and that has a number of categories and same thing with broadcast media and then you've got the leadership awards uh, that's broader you know for those who are leading in uh, creating uh, more resources uh, working with farmers uh, working on sustainability and then you've got of course the restaurant and chef awards that are the most known, I would say, and they have a ton of various categories, as you say, you know, standing chef, regional, etc. Do the number of winners vary from year to year? Or is it always a set amount of winners? It's, uh, it depends on the categories. So yeah. each program has a set of uh, subcommittee members. Uh, 
And those subcommittee members are overseen by the awards committee. Uh, and Tanya can, if you want, you can talk a little bit about uh, your role uh, in that regard, but they all have committees and those committees every year look at the categories and try to keep them, you know, as current and relevant based on trends going on in their industries. All right. right. For, for example, yeah, probably in the beginning, you know, there's certain regions that weren't recognized or, you know, there may have been just Northwest, including California. Now I think it's, you know, Oregon and Washington are separate, you know, as the markets develop and there's more mm -hmm. talent in certain areas, um, you know, to include those folks. Um, right. I can't think of other examples offhand, but it could be like, you know, where it used to be, you know, maybe Boston was in New England, but now Boston might have their own and then, you know, other parts of New England have, you know, or, or, or looked at. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the chair award is, is great for being, you know, the chef, the industry voice representative, you know, actually active in the industry and um, been able to impact and, and change the makeup of the committee members and the judges since, since I've been on board, you know, just really bringing this diversity, uh, which I've been speaking to for, for decades, diversity, equity, inclusion that has lacking and frankly was really lacking in the early days of the Beard Foundation um, awards. It was very European male centric, the winners. And so I just really, um, you know, it was important to me to <clears throat> um, get involved and and see how we could make a difference. And as Dawn said, I've been um, involved in some of the programs. So the boot camps for the chefs have been just phenomenal and really life changing because, you know, a lot of times as a chef and owner of a restaurant, as you know, you don't really work next to your peers. You are working with people who work for you. So, you know, to be with, with peers and exchange ideas and then also you know, further develop our skill sets through the tools that the Beard Foundation provided by, um, you know, having people there for us to um, teach us how to leverage our influence in our community to really impact our community even and even more so um, has been great. And then I, you know, you have a new, whole new set of friends and resources that you can reach out to when you're in need, like, hey, where are you sourcing this from? How are you dealing with, you know, your mental health? How are you, you know, doing with this? It's just been, it's a great alumni group. And I was fortunate enough to participate in two of those. And then um, also was in the inaugural class of the Women Entrepreneur Leadership um, class, which was a program originally at Babson. And um, I went to Babson. <laughs> you did oh wow. it's a great cool. <laughs> cool. and I I worked in Boston for a while so I always heard great things about it and you know we essentially got a little mini MBA in five days I mean it was very 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 mini <laughs> and um but really you know building on our skill sets as entrepreneurs um so not everybody was a restaurateur somewhere in consumer product goods um you know, bakeries, um, you know, people at different levels in their career development. And, um, you know, it's just been, it's, it's great that, you know, the foundation is doing more than just, you know, giving out awards for excellence. And now we are also discussing what is excellence, you know, I mean, the, it's such a different industry than it was 20 years ago. And having a white tablecloth and fancy china does not necessarily mean you know, you don't serve, if you don't have it, your food can still be excellent. You know, For your sure. hospitality can still be excellent. So really trying to, um, you know, equal the playing field and um, recognize all sorts of voices at whatever levels. Yeah. I mean, I feel like what Tanya has said just really uh, illustrates uh, good food for good which is essentially the philosophy of the James Beard Foundation. Good food for good, you know? It touches everybody in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, more than winning an award, the idea I think for the foundation, which is exciting and which is uh, one of the reasons I joined was, this is so exciting. The foundation offers a life cycle right, of someone who wants to be in the industry. And at any, you know, you can hit some of the marks at any given point. So you could have uh, 
participated in the Chef's Boot Camp. You could have participated in the WELD program. You may have received a scholarship. You might have received an award and decided, oh, I've been a chef and maybe now I want to do something else, but still within the space. So that's what we endeavor to do. And we will continue to develop our programs to and so that we can continue to support those who are in the industry. Wonderful. Yeah, and, you know, that's a, uh, another reason why I fell in love with this industry is that you know, there's just so many options, you know, that you could be a chef, but then you might decide to study wine, like you said, or you might decide you want to be in the management part. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's an interesting industry. It really it is. is. It is. And as you said, Peter, it doesn't matter your formal education, right? You can come from all different backgrounds, you know, and we're case in point, John was an opera singer and I applied to all engineering schools and have a degree in Russian language and literature. So, you know, you just never know. <laughs> this is true. It's a diverse industry, diverse cultures are involved and there are diverse opportunities within the entire industry. Yeah. Are the awards held in? Oh, you have a friend. That ah! is that is the, the studio mascot right there. And every once in a while, he likes to... Making a cameo. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Are the awards held in different places each year? Or is it always the same place? Uh, well, I think over the years, it's it, it has been in the same place. So we, we have the Restaurant and Chef Awards in Chicago. And that's mm -hmm. where we'll be going this year. So that's Wonderful. exciting. What a great Love restaurant that city, city that is as well. Mm. Oh, my God. Totally. And it's a gorgeous city full of rich, rich culture all throughout all the neighborhoods. Uh, so the Restaurant and Chef Awards will take place on June 13th mm -hmm. at the uh, Lyric Opera Theater. So that's cool. exciting. And we'll shortly, uh, we'll soon be announcing the rest of our announcement dates uh, on the website. So people can visit us at jamesbeard.org backslash awards. <laughs> Let's dive into the criteria for admissions and how people are nominated to receive a, a reward, a, an award in each category. How does that work? For all of the programs? Yeah. You know, um, sure. how, how is recognition um, determined? I mean, who, who decides? Uh, obviously, you have a committee and whatnot, but mm -hmm. the nomination process, I'd like to find out all about that. Sure, sure. I'll start with the media awards. So I, I think that'll be a little more straight, uh, more straightforward. And I know your audience probably wants to hear more about the restaurant and chef. So <laughs> for the media awards, for each of those, mm -hmm. we have a call for entry period. And that was uh, in October and it ended in uh, at the end of November. Uh, you get to submit your, right, your, your piece or pieces, your book, et cetera. Uh, and um, and then it goes through you know various processes, right? We they they're screened, they're looked at, a ballot is created, and then we have rounds rounds of voting for the voting body. So committee members and then their judges go out and vote, and whoever gets the best score wins. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. And then for the restaurant and chef awards and leadership, it's a call for recommendations. So the subcommittee and the judges can submit their recommendations for all of the categories. In addition to that, members of the industry, consumers, anybody can also submit their recommendations. The committee looks at those recommendations along with the judges, they rank them, and then the subcommittee forms a, a semi-finalist list after voting on, you know, based on the results of um, just looking through all of the, the uh, submissions. Semi-finalist lists, they're oh. announced. And then there's two, there's another round of voting where nominees are chosen, and then another round of voting when you have the winner. It's pretty straightforward. And I think uh, one of the results of our audit uh, to be more transparent and clear really about the process and the procedure was to place everything on our website. It's a lot of information, but it's very clear. You can actually, there's even a graph. You can see exactly what the steps are if anybody's interested in that. Um, one of the major, I would say significant results of our audit was to better align the mission of the awards 
uh, to that of the foundation and its values. You know, so of course, excellence in your craft is central. Of course. If you're a chef, I mean, come on, the food is central, right? But also hospitality. Uh, if you're a writer, then of course your piece, for example. And what efforts are you making in your way, in your own way to advance, you know, equity, sustainability, and how are you helping to advance your industry uh, to create a more sustainable and uh, industry and culture? That's, that's terrific. That's exactly what I was looking for. Is the award itself, or can you describe what the award itself is? Is it a tangible uh, oh, trophy, she... a plaque? I mean, what exactly <laughs> is it? Is it something that chefs display in their restaurants, not just chefs, but award winners? Tell us mm -hmm. about, does it change every year or is it always this iconic, whatever it is? Tell us about that. It's iconic. It's a medallion. Okay. Yeah. You know, they yeah. beat the eighties when medallions were in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Remember okay. the hip -hop, early hip hop days? <laughs> sure. It's a medallion on a lovely ribbon and, uh, it has the, the face of James Beard and of mm -hmm. course, James that Beard makes Award. sense. Sure. And then we have seals that people can use on their book, for example, and, and the winners receive a, a certificate. Yes. And you often see those certificates framed and right, you know right. posted in restaurants, like in a very clear location, because they do add a lot of, they've always, you know, been prestigious and yeah. they are significant in our industry. Can a winner ever win more than one award? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> That's possible. So you can be recognized numerous times and win, mm -hmm. a, win multiple James Beard awards. And you can win several in the same year. There's been, oh, wow. uh, you know, best chef and then best regional restaurant, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, there's a few chefs that have won that award. And, they, and you know, your cookbook comes out the same year. Who knows? Right, exactly. So I think... And for and for the for the awards, it depends on the category. There are definitely guidelines that are outlined in the eligibility forms that we share with anybody who wants to submit someone or submit themselves. So you can kind of see hmm. where you know you can either apply for yourself or on behalf of someone else to be considered for the Restaurant and Chef Awards. Same thing with the other awards programs. What are the hopes and plans that you each have for the future of the industry and the foundation? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I think, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of our colleagues said this in a meeting, and I say it a lot, and I think we all are working with this. We're working in drafts. We have made significant changes over the last few years, and specifically around the awards, uh, which we've uh, touched on a bit here. Uh, thanks to Tanya's leadership, the leadership of our you know, the organization and so many of our committee members. Um, but it's not like, oh, we made these changes, we're good, let's go. We will continue to work on making sure that we are being equitable, that we understand what we mean when we say sustainability, that we are, uh, you know, creating more accessibility, being as transparent as we possibly can be and making sure that people understand when they are applying for these awards, what they actually mean, you know? Um, and I think we wanna make sure that the awards and all of the programs continue and build on really as a serving, serving as a resource um, for those who have won and those who might win. So if you've won and you wanna be a mentor to someone, we've got all these programs that really support that. I mean, so many people are going through it with COVID and the impact that it's had on this industry. We have had programs and we continue to build those um, as we kind of get through this, you know, and any future, fingers crossed, <laughs> pandemics. Yeah. Right, right. It's really important. Yeah. Like. The other day, we uh, colleagues of, of ours put together a Chefs Connect, which is something we do from time to time, just creating a space for people to get together and just talk and share ideas. How are you doing? How are you getting through this? How are you managing with staff, staffing? How are you managing with 
I don't know, you know, kind of like what Tanya uh, supply chains, everything. Oh yeah, right. rising and, cost, supply chains, the pandemic, right. the labor crisis. These are the biggest right. issues facing so, us all right now. Everything. Yes. And you know, some of our colleagues have also been, you know, involved in natural disasters, fires and floods, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's just there's just a lot, and you know, we're frontline workers, and um, you know, just a, an industry that doesn't have a lot of regulation and infrastructure. So, you know, what the foundation is doing also is looking at this and trying to create programs and systems to support, you know, us, especially the independent operators who yep. need a lot more support than, say, a chain restaurant or, you know, hotel restaurant or something like that. Absolutely. Well, that's a wonderful mission also. So thanks yeah. for sharing. Do we each have best advice? You know, we've talked a little bit about the pandemic. It's decimated the industry and it's really sad how many restaurants have been forced to close, but yet that creates a rebirth and there's so much new opportunity for people just entering the industry. There's so many spaces for lease with fit ups ready to go restaurants that were operating just months ago. Now they're just sitting there and people can enter this industry and just grow it again from the ground up, what advice would you share for the industry as a whole, you know, as we move out of the pandemic into the future, what do you see? No one's got the crystal ball, of course, but people have been through, you know, the worst of times, optimism is out there. Uh, customers are returning to restaurants in droves. I mean, the, the industry is really booming once again, yet we still haven't moved, moved past the challenges that we're facing, some of which you've already mentioned. So what would, what would each of your best advice be to anyone listening that might be inspired by hearing what you talked about, might want to open a restaurant, just might be hanging on saying, I've made it this mm-hmm. far and it's been so difficult and I've got to dig deep, but I can still see a future in this business. What, what would you say to those people? Um, yeah, I'll go first. So there is a cycle, you know, I mean, a lot of us who have been in this business know that, you know, it's advantageous to get a restaurant space that is in its second, third or fourth generation, right? So you you inherit um, the bones of, you know, the expenses. You don't have to incur that like raw space build out, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, you don't have to build in the clientele because people already got used to coming here. I mean, I've I've done that in creating spaces, I've done that in leaving spaces for people to inherit and, you know, just close my last restaurant. And, um, but you know, it's always going to be an evolution. Change is inevitable. Obviously there's some restaurants have been there forever, but I think, you know, we have to be open to having these discussions with our colleagues and there's no shame in failure. Failure is a lesson. It's a tool for growth. And, um, you know, I think we should all be open to sharing what we've experienced and, um, you know, so that the next generation of operator can, you know, have some advantage. That's not, that's going to advance the entire industry. That's not going to give someone an advantage on you. And, you know, I'm, I'm just not a fan of this, like, sort of hoarding of information, because I think we all grow and uh, learn when we share it. And I, you know, that's what I would encourage um you know, people going into industry, I always say, when I speak to people, I say, talk to as many people who will listen and listen to as many people who will talk because you just can't, you can't know enough in this business. There's, there's always something to learn. You learn from other people's mistakes. That's why I've always tried when I was younger to work for the most successful restaurant tours and, and chefs and operators. And, um, you know, I just want to encourage people to do that. Thank you so much for sharing. How about you, Dawn? I mean, I feel like Tanya really covered so much. Uh, she really covered the spirit of, of of anything that I might have to say. You know, I'm not an operator, never have been. I think I would say, just reiterate, if possible, you know, everybody's in a different place. Uh, try to be open. Try to try to pivot. Try to try different things, and you know, reach out to your community reach out to that community, care for your community too. Uh, and I, when I say community, where your place is, where you live and your restaurant and chef, and if your food media, that community. Exactly. That is the only way to survive as a human, I think, and particularly in this industry. Um, and, you know, reach out to the Beard Foundation, seriously. 
Yes. Thank you so much for sharing both ladies. You're doing a wonderful service for this industry. I think you've inspired us all and the people that you're involved with are so inspiring. And I love the fact that you're moving forward for, you know, racial equity and gender equity and sustainability. These are all important things for the future of, of this business. So that in and, in and of itself is a tremendous service. Thanks so much to our audience for tuning in. That was another episode of the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and we'll see you all next time. Stay well, everyone. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Tanya, for being guests on the podcast. And thanks for sharing what the James Beard Foundation is all about, as well as the awards and the new categories and everything that you're doing to raise awareness and change for racial and gender equality and sustainability uh, within the foundation and the industry as a whole. So thank you for that. Thank you also to our sponsors of this week's episode, Davo, which is sales tax on autopilot, as well as Smithfield Culinary and the the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. Profit. It's something that we should think about all the time. These are crazy times. And as we know, costs are rising and margins are shrinking and disappearing, actually. Well, those of you who have followed me know that when I ran restaurants, profit was uppermost and, and top of my priority list. And it should be for you as well. So why not head on over to restaurantrockstars.com where we are giving away absolutely free the top three ways you're killing your restaurant profits. It's information, powerful information that'll help you immediately actionable ideas to help you dial in your restaurant's profits and do so quickly because for a limited time, we're also giving away our free restaurant assessment. Whether you're starting your very first restaurant and you're just getting into the business, this will help you. If you're a veteran operator and you're just looking to optimize your operation, we have a version obviously for veteran existing restaurants as well. Again, it's the restaurant assessment, thought-provoking information that'll really give you actionable ideas. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? That'll really make an impact in your business. So check that out at restaurantrockstars.com. Thanks again for listening and tuning in. We appreciate our audience. Everyone stay well. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to, to the, the Restaurant, Restaurant Rockstars, Rockstars Podcast. Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.